Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another session of Prabodhan. Just two months ago, we met and we spoke about the apprehensions of monsoon. And today we are already talking about flooding everywhere. But such vagaries of nature are the least of the deterrents for the fearless speaker of the day. A very special welcome to Lieutenant General Rajendra Nimbhorkar. I request Sri Madan Vajpayee of Pravodhan Mancha to felicitate him in our usual tradition. As mentioned, uh, we are now active on Instagram, and we are also doing shots and reels on Twitter and Facebook. We hope this encourages many more people, especially the youngsters to watch our YouTube channel, which now has almost 21,000 subscribers. As we complete 75 years of independence, enter the Amrit Kal, and move to the centenary of freedom, it's time to look at the who, the what, and the how of defending our freedom. How has our posture and attitude changed? How do we aspire to become a superpower of the future? In short, what's India's new defense paradigm? And who better than Lieutenant General Nimborkar to talk about it? Lieutenant General Rajendra Nimborkar, the byline in our poster actually says it all. PVSM, UISM, AVSM, VSM, and VSM, honored with every variant of the Seva Medal and the Sena Medal. <laughs> Hailing from Vidarbha and an alumnus of Sainik School Satara, National Defense Academy Pune, and the Indian Military Academy Dehradun, he was commissioned into the 15th Punjab Regiment in 1979. His glorious career of almost 40 years had many great victories and honors for him, but he's best remembered for his role in the surgical strikes. Having seen it all, <laughs> having seen it all, uh, we are very sure you will agree that we couldn't have found a better speaker to cover this topic. The warrior in our speaker told me that the speech is going to be shorter because he'd like more bullets in the form of question and answer. And therefore, while we have some questions ready as always, please give more questions to our volunteers. We will as always try and cover them, but we will also screen some of them for appropriateness and brevity. So do give them to our volunteers and over to you, General Nimborkar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, am I audible in the end? Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, it gives me a great pleasure in coming to the lecture of Prabodhan Manch. It's actually a proud privilege and unique honor to be here amongst you. Why I say so? Because uh, audience at Mumbai is very intellectually stimulating. And I was posted here for about three years as a, a general officer commanding of Maharashtra, Gujarat and Goa area. And I found there is a distinct difference between the cultures of various places. Mumbai stands out apart. Not even Delhi cannot compare it with uh, some of the things which Mumbai offers. <laughs> Having said that, uh, I, for the today's lecture, would uh, try to cover 
the defense paradigm shift which has occurred and in a different manner. Firstly, I'll narrate as per me, what are the main factors which are responsible for this new defense paradigm? And these will include various wars we fought since our independence. And what do we learn from it? And how has it impacted the today's shift in the defense? But then the major milestone, you know, uh, as they say, money makes the mayor go. Without money, nothing can happen. So there was a shift in our policy of defense production and support to the services. And that was Make in India, which happened in 2016. I'll uh, dwell on it. And the third and most important thing as uh, I was introduced that there is a mindset change in the Indian psyche as well as international psyche when we showcased our capability to go inside POK and strike the terrorist camp there, fondly called as surgical strikes. So I'll dwell in detail as to how it happened, how it was conceived and what all it happened there. And thereafter, I'll take questions, etc., if time permits, on theater commands, the human resource management, that is induction of ladies in the armed forces, and the latest Agnivir scheme. And apart from this, you can ask me any questions. I'll be most happy to uh, answer them. Uh, before that, uh, are we on a media? No, we are not live. Okay, fine. So this gives me a liberty <laughs> to say, not that because I actually wanted to be very uh, open with you. Because especially in the surgical strike, people ask, did this happen, that happened. Some of the things because of, uh, of OSA is difficult to answer. Here, of course, if you are not there and I, I say the Chattenham rules should be followed. It's between you and me. And therefore, I say you ask anything, and I'll be most open. There are a number of friends from my school, from the armed forces here, and uh, they know what are our constraints and how far we can go. And anyway, having said that, and of course, you can stop me anytime when you feel that, you know, uh, enough is enough. OK, so let's get on to the wars. And the first, we start from our independence 47-48, Jammu and Kashmir operations. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very, very peculiar war fought. And why I say peculiar? Not because that fighting capital would less. The man who was controlling the things in India was a Britisher. And the man who was controlling things from Pakistan was also Britisher. And both sides were fighting. That means both the chas from the same nation knew exactly what is happening. So whatever the outcome was decided by them, come what may. Actually, I don't understand as to why we got into this kind of a situation or we are forced into it. So it is like you no know, puppeteer, you know, having the puppets in hand, moving the way he wanted. As a result, and this is my theory, and after having researched on this quite a bit, it was probably the Britishers wanted major part of Kashmir, J&K, to go to Pakistan. And definitely they wanted Gilgit Baltistan. I'm quite certain you know where Gilgit Baltistan is there, and what is the importance of it? It played a major role in the great game between Russia, UK, and in that time, those major powers. So they, they took whatever they wanted, and made us fight. OK, let it be that. The most important thing, 47 and 48, we fought. We shed our blood. A lot of soldiers died. And step by step, inch by inch, we captured the territory, what is called POK, from scratch, totally. We had already lost 
Cham, we had nearly lost Aknur, we lost everything this side. And the uh, raiders, so-called raiders, the Pakistani disguised as Kabailis, were near Srinagar. And since then we rolled them down. And in end of 48, we were in, sitting in a, such a position that if we could have taken POK and Gilgit Baltistan, not means we would have required maximum about six months. Maximum six months. We had already linked up Punch, which was isolated for a year. We had linked up from Uri side. We had captured the entire valley, Kupwada, everything. So there was no stopping. And suddenly came a bolt from the blue. As our prime minister then, I don't know the compulsion, decided to go to the United Nations. And I am not a great poet or something, but I am reminded of a couplet in this situation when he says, Wo wakt bhi dekha hai, wakt ki gaharayon ne galib, lamo ne khata ki aur sadiyon ne saja pai. Because of this one short mistake, one small mistake, you know how much we suffered? My arm, I am from infantry. We lost at least 12,000 soldiers since then for various operations. Those would have saved. And this money which we spent there, we could have done for moderates and so many other things. And of course, this problem which is festering wound would have been solved for once for all. And why go to the UN if there was a problem? You sort it out amongst yourself. Who is you want to come in between? So anyway, that was, those were the mistakes of 47, 48, then came 62. And you know all happened. What all happened there? The soldiers fought very bravely. But those of you who want to lay Ladakh or Tawang, there you find what kind of weather there is. And when you soldiers fight with canvas boots on, <coughs> A rifle which is bolt, bolted rifle. There is no cold, extreme cold clothing. When you go to the heights, you get hapo and so many other diseases. Still the soldiers fought very bravely. And here there was a diplomatic and a political failure. In fact, before 62, the professional soldiers had given their opinion as to how to defend Tawang salient and Ladakh salient which for some reason was disregarded. And the man behind this was from our state, Lieutenant General Thorat. He made a beautiful plan. If it would have gone by it, China would have actually been eating dust that time. But it was not accepted. Second and most important thing was human resource management in the Indian Armed Forces. There is a total political interference. And I said, why I say this was that when the fighting corps, four corps, which was responsible for fighting in, in Tawang, Nefa then, was an officer from Army Supply Corps, not Supply Corps, Service Corps, which actually deals with provisioning of rations, etc. and got no war fighting. He was a corps commander. Corps commander is a man who is responsible for fighting in the battle himself. Conceptualizing. So how can a man who has been trained for, you know, a logistics role, fight a battle, but he was made there. And then we know what happened. Third most important thing, and I feel is a lesson to be learned, was we did not use the Indian Air Force, very potent weapon. In 47, we saw as to what we did. They logistically, they supported. With the bomber, they supported. So why didn't we use? We had all the advantages. Chinese did not have a good Air Force. And when the Air Force takes off from a valley, sea level, near sea level, that is from Assam, our all of weight goes up. And we can operate much better than the chap who is taking off from high altitude. So what, what all little research I carried out found that we were worried that if we use the Air Force, they'll bomb our cities like Lucknow, Calcutta. So when you're in the ring, then you have to be ready to take a punch. You just can't say, I'll keep on punching him, I'll not take me. But with little experience and knowledge, I got, if we, we would have used the Air Force, we wouldn't have been in a position where we are today. 
And we actually, Chinese, we have learned a great lesson of their life that never to uh, cross the path with the Indians. But anyway, that's what. Then came 65. 65, we are a little badly off. In a sense, Pakistanis saw that we are pushovers. You know, 62 was playing very heavily on our mind. They did try to see our preparedness in the runoff catch, where actually we did not again come out well. But that was not a fault. There were many other reasons for that. And then, again, they started infiltrating in Kashmir with a view to take it back. And little realizing that there might be a good leadership in India. And Lal Bahadur Shastri decided to open up the Punjab front. And the whole history then thereafter changed. Where we failed in 65, though it was a stalemate, kind of a stalemate, that I, in the hand, with the wisdom of hindsight, feel that we shouldn't have given the areas which we captured. We lost some. We lost mainly in Akhnur sector. But it's okay, we would have taken it in some other time. But we had gained Hazipir Pass. We had gone on the borders of Lahore. We had already captured Bata Factory of Lahore. And there are so many other smalls, and in deserts we were captured. So we could have firmly stood our ground and not negotiated with giving back the areas. But good thing out of it, even though the Pakistanis had a better weapons, better weapon system, better equipment, we still uh, gave a good exposition of ourselves and good account for us. So this, though it was a stalemate, we learned some lessons from 65. Then came the hour of glory for us, 1971. You all know, mainly it can be called a mini world war. America was involved, Russia was involved, though diplomatically. Uh, China, of course, was a neutral. And we, Bangladesh subsequently, and Pakistan. So, so many nations were involved. And we made sure that the nation was liberated. And here, it brings me now to a question. Now, you can also ask yourself, did we do a right thing by liberating Bangladesh? One nation which has got the longest border with India. Now you see, there is China, Pakistan. But the longest border, do you know which is the nation? Is Bangladesh. 3,913 kilometers of the international border is with Bangladesh. And then we gave an explanation. Uh, you are all learned, you must have known the map. There is something called a chicken neck as they call it, or Siliguri Corridor, which is just from Chumbi Valley, it is about 21 kilometers. And we're always worried. Chinese will come here, the Chas will come from south, and north is will be separated. So why do we only take the opposites? Optimism. Now, if he can go, take, go through Sikarnik, we can go through his head also. We can cut his head and polish him off. So if we'd have not liberated the Bangladesh, Pakistan, would have been divided into two sides, you know, uh, at a distance of various this thing, not supporting each other, and there are major problems for him. So this is in a wisdom of how However, 71 was a good bet. Again, there, diplomatically, we lost some of the things. We gave back about 93,000 soldiers. We were PWs. But we did not get anything in return. We just kept the areas what we, they won, what we won. Here we would have bargained hard and got all, all our areas back and kept the areas which we won. So therefore, hard bargaining was required. But in a sense, we learned a lot of things from there. We knew how to, uh, how our drills were, you know, what to do, how to improve our defenses. And the major thing was our defense fraternity stood their ground. They did not bow down to a political indecision or incorrect decision and made sure that our decision or our whatever our viewpoint was accepted by the government. So that was, then came, a lot go in between what all has happened. The major point came in our security concern was 1988-89. Now why I'm saying this, if you take back your mind, see this was the most critical time in India's independent India's history, security with the, as, as regards to security, external as internal. If you see, Nepal was not on good terms with us. 
Bangladesh as it is was not good. I was there in Bangladesh for a year and I was interacting with various senior officers and their very senior uh, military officers for one year. And mind you, in Bangladesh, there are two categories of supporters. One are 50 percent are totally anti-India and 50 percent are neutral. There is nobody pro-India. So that time Bangladesh also was against us because of the political hierarchy there. We, have, we were having problems with Sri Lanka. Oh, the Siachin was there. Pakistan itself was a problem. There's a problem in Maldives. And most importantly, our economy had gone down. We are just left with, I think, 21 days of foreign reserves. And this was the ideal time which Shaulak thought we must bleed India by 1,000 cuts. And then 88, 89, it started. And subsequently, by about 2000, to control the insurgency which it started. So these were the major milestones. And the last of this was in 1999, when Pakistanis came and sat down our um, lifeline, which goes uh, from Srinagar to Leh Radak. And uh, there again, our armed forces gave a good account of themselves. And if you have gone there in Kargil or Leh, you would have seen what kind of heights are there. It, it is very difficult to you know, climb with uh, empty hands. And then fighting there and winning against the entrenched I mean, you have to ground those soldiers who sacrificed their life, that yes, they did this for the sake of the nation. But here again, we learned two things. Here everything was in sync. And as I said, that when you are having, uh, is in the realms of this house, I want to confess that we missed a golden opportunity of teaching Pakistan a lesson. Not that we, and why I say so? All my friends from the armed forces and also those who are uh, you know, students of the warfare, they said in mountains you never fight against a hard target. You never attack a target. And easiest thing is to do a theory of torrents. You know, and when the water flows, you just avoid hard thing and goes around. Here we had a chance. Um, there is a place called Minimug Pass, which controls the flow of troops, rations, logistics into POK, uh, into Gilgit, Balkistan. Now, if you capture this pass, everything is finished. And once they came in like this, you don't fight. You just go and sit down in various places. We had enough troops. We would have starved these people who had come inside, would have got the area which we wanted, and then Pakistan would have purposed Of course, that is, you no. Know, we learn later from our mistakes. That was a mistake, but yes, we did your good account for, of ourselves. The second big mistake we did was a disjointness between two commanders. The Air Force Chief and the Armed Forces Chief, Army Chief. Initially, when the battle started, war started, it was only army fighting, and we were having a lot of reverses. And when it was requested of uh, Air Chief to give support, he said, let the government tell me. Now, this is not anybody's war, it is a combined war. You have to fight combinedly. And also equally fault of Army chief, he says, we'll fight with her, whatever we have. But this is not your personal fiefdom. You're losing about 700 boys. So you have to fight jointedly. And then you see when Air Force joined after about 15 days, what were the results? All these casualties would have been saved if Air Force would have come on the first day. Now, why I'm mentioning this, this led to the thing that there has to be integration in thinking, concept, and execution of battle. And this led to Subramanian County. We said that there has to be CDS, which never came till 2014 when the present government took charge. And now at least in some form, there is a CDS and theater commands, which are now coming and which will be a potent 
organization. And this is being formed in the lines of United States Armed Forces. Similar thing used to happen in United States also. Uh, different rivalries. Air Force, Army, Navy, thinking yourself, you know, he is the supreme. But it was forced down their throat. You have to be integrated. And accordingly, here also, now it has been forced down our throat, we have to be integrated. So this is a, a good uh, uh, thing which has happened. So now, after having seen the problems which were created and what all we learned, now come on to the second most important factor is the Make in India. Now, Make in India primarily is for defense because the rest of the things already made in India. Our food is there, where clothes are there, our vehicles are there, you know, automobile sector, communication, everything was booming. The problem was with defense. Now, I say, so I was directly involved with the procurement for the Indian Armed Forces for two and a half years. So I used to control a budget of about 20,000 crores and buy. Every year, I am only giving the example of arm, army. Every year, we used to import goods, weapons, equipment worth about 45,000 crores. Now, what were the goods and this thing? Couldn't we make it ourselves? When we make rockets, no good, ISRO makes rockets, go to the moon, then also. Couldn't we do? And uh, when you, you laugh when you see the list, we used to import socks. Can't we make socks here? We used to import jackets. We used to import boots. The best of the boots which are made, South African army, Israeli army, which are very quality conscious, take boot from Kanpur. So these were the things which say, and we were quite uh, aware of this thing. And here I want, with the permission of the chair, I want to mention one thing. We got, and I must say people may contradict me, one of the best defense ministers of India ever we got was Mr. Manohar Parikar. <laughs> he has to be credited with this Make in India policy. And uh, I was working very closely with him. At the moment I joined, he used to talk to me in Marathi. He said, Tumala he karai chai. And then he had given me the, I hope uh, colloquially if I say something in Marathi, it's okay. So, so he told me there are nine ammunition, nine types of ammunition, which cost around 15,000 crore every year we get. So why can't we make in India? It's okay. Sir, then this nine, I struggled hard. For two years, I worked on it. And took out for the private players, this uh, RFP, as we call RFP, request for proposals come. And our industry was geared up, very well geared up. But somehow, there is something called bureaucracy in India. That RFP, which already was there on the site, it could not be finalized or it could not fructify because of very, very frivolous things. <coughs> you know, MOD, Ministry of Defense Finance, they put that, uh, the, um, uh, what we call the bank guarantee cannot be from Axis Bank. I mean, whether it's from Axis Bank or S Bank or SDFC, how does it matter? But no, two years took. And till 2022, this had not fructified in spite of everything in place. And there seems to be no responsibility, no accountability. If I, if I delay a particular thing, it costs my nation thousands of rupees. Who is responsible for that? Somebody has to take the approach. This, this did not happen. And I'll ask you one simple question, apart from my army friends. You tell me who is responsible for defense of country, our country? Who is, who is supposed to defend in a hierarchy who is responsible for defense of India? Can anyone tell me? Prime Minister is one. Who else? Defense Minister. Chiefs. Gen Ladies and gentlemen, we are all wrong. The man who is supposed to be responsible for defense of India is Defense Secretary. And he knows nothing about defense. 
defense secretary today he comes he was a shipping minister shipping secretary or a commerce secretary or a agriculture secretary or a minorities secretary now such a complex subject mr manor parik number of time used to tell me a sahab tumcha he he mala kay kalat nahi kunti cme and kunti eme mala sarkhas vatte you know when the man of that caliber he confessed ki it's so difficult so how can a person who has not had any sting with defense how can he understand and perform so in 2016 when at uh, when these things came he'll be amazed to know when the balloon was supposed to go up that means we are near apli ladai cha aple tonda var alo to apan tema a surgical strike kele hote ani asa vatat hota ki we will be going to war or ammunition condition of our ammunition because i directly responsible provisioning i can't tell you we should not know also but i suffice to say that we are not capable of fighting a sustained war and the defense secretary when it was presented he said ye pehle kyun nahi bataya bhai so from 1990 we said we have been demanding this he had no answer he just held his head like this what to do and then again our defense was stepped in he told all of us we are responsible that go wherever in the world within a month i want ammunition stocks to be replenished and after that with his policies he made sure that we are capable of fighting a war for a particular length of because i will not give time length of any time when the war start will fight for this much period and subsequently other things will be replenished again hats off to that man one man made the difference and today we are very thoroughly prepared now when in 2016 when this policy came make in india we used to we were had a dubious distinction of being the highest importer in the world of arms ammunition etc and as i said 45 50000 of army itself and so you can extrapolate today after all this make in india i am proud to say because i also involved in many of the things today as of now as of date our exports are 23070 crores so this is a because of the shift in policy because of forcing the people not to go abroad and accept in india now there are problems problems still there are there which has to be removed and the greatest problem is indian ordnance factories indian ordnance factories are 60 plus factories which actually were established by the british in pre second world war to provide for forces fighting on the burma front on the african front and the middle east so india was a good hub and they played their part subsequently now when we wanted so they were i i am sorry to say they are totally inefficient when we give them a demand of ammunition for 25000 crore they will only produce 5000 crore and that ammunition they will give us which we already have in excess but the ammunition which want they will not give us we took what do you call i had some technical terms uh, pardon me for that is called something called transfer of technology so we have make ammunition say from russia the transfer that we pay for it after having transfer of technology they could not produce a round one round of tank cost 1 lakh 41000 rupees and if you pay all this money to russians and obviously you are the people i say here we squander the money but you are the one who ask the government for the accountability of each and every rupees you spent on defense there is no more are the days holy cow that defense no no we should not discuss why not it is your money is it being pro paid properly or not but fortunately now we also streamlined our procedures and we are in a bit now today i can again say apart from the exports today we are making world class guns in private sector bharat forge is making we are making light tanks which never we thought will make it we are also making uh, ammunition of various types we are making ships aircraft carrier we are also making 
fighters, and there is not far that we'll be exporting this. So there is shift which has happened because there are a number of things we can say of uh, this thing and the bureaucratic health, the Indian ordnance factories were made for this, but they started getting into stitching of clothes. Now, any darji can stitch the clothes anywhere. Why only Indian factories did? And even my army friends will be aghast when I tell them the fact we got something called combat dress. Now combat dress wish to get it from the ordnance factories. And for this combat dress, there is a shirt and a pant. Can you beat it? What will the cost? Any human, any, any normal man, how much will be the cost? I mean, ma'am, you can make a guess. How much will be the cost for pant and shirt? Thousand rupees? Fifteen hundred? Two thousand? These factories used to charge us, because we used to, I used to sign the payment, four thousand seven hundred and sixty-eight rupees for one combat dress. I think, even the, oh, the oh, sp sp uh, these um, astronauts which wear it will be much cheaper than this, I think. <laughs> so these were the things which were actually, they were taking us for a ride. And say, I want, say, 100 rounds of bullets. So today cost is 5 rupees per bullet. So they will not tell me the cost. Because they want to show that they are in profit. And they were allowed that you can fix your cost. So they say their expenditure is 2,000 rupees, they'll share the cost. So bullet which to cost 5 rupees will also cost 50 rupees. It's up to them and we have got no choice. So these were things which now have been sorted out to a great extent. There is a lot of things to be done. And uh, suffice to say that we are on the good path, path to recovery. And therefore, this Make in India is helping us to shift the paradigm in today's paradigm in new defense in our way, in our, to our advantage. <laughs> so this, briefly, I can, any questions on this I can take because I was neck deep into this. Next is a surgical strike. Now here, I have personally conceived this, gave the plan, got it executed, and it did not boomerang. No, it fired well. So, I'll just give the brief background of it. Just keep my... See, what happened in 2015 July, something like this had happened. Our soldiers had died in Northeast. And the terrorist, Northeastern terrorist, they had killed our soldiers by ambush. So what did we do? They ran to Myanmar, we went after them and we killed them. Now, if you read the statement of the Pakistani interior minister then, he said, Bharat kabhi aisi galti se bhi na soj baithe ki hum Myanmar hai. So giving a veiled threat that friends don't dare something like this. Now, we never thought also that time, but anyway, this gave us idea. And then, I mean, I was a senior officer then, we thought that we will not think you are Myanmar, we will think you are Pakistan only, but we will tell you in some, something. As a, since captain, I was in LC most of the time, and we had all plans, we should have a chance to do it. 16th September, 2016, in the morning at around 5, 5, there was a terrorist attack by four elite terrorists on our Udi camp. And uh, of course, it was uh, uh, very well executed by them. And we suffered a lot of casualties. About 18 Jawans died and about 38 were injured. As a, it's a big blow to our morale. And I was a core commander of 16 Corps, which is responsible for 270 kilometers of line of control to the south of Pir Panjal. And there are another General Duwa who was junior to me, who was controlling on the other side. So we uh, like talking to them. He said, sir, ye to ho gaya, hum kya kar sakte abhi? So I said, chalo, apne plan to bana lete. So we made plans. And we knew exactly what has to be done. 
and I, if you see on 17th of September, Prime Minister came on the air and he said that whosoever has done this, he'll have to pay for it. So again in the night, when evening we have something called, you know, giving report to our bosses. So there after that we have five, six minutes. So I asked Dua, said, yaar, ye to, sir, I see hai ye. Ye kya hota hai? Bolenge ke haan, hum to jawab denge ke aise chalega bolta hai. Apna plan man to koi bana ke rakh lo, but hoga kuch nahi. So I said yes. So in fact, he gave me a very comical answer. He will say that we will give the stone from the stone. He says, what will we do with the stone? Our reply will be that we will play cricket with them. He says, sir, this is not going to happen. We can relax. And I said, okay, okay. So, but notwithstanding that, since we had all grown up in this environment, we had kept about, we have got something called ghataks and we had some uh, troops of uh, SF special forces, and we give them the task. You know, you be ready for this, you know, particular task, target. And on 21st of September, I still remember it was morning, I got a call from Mr. Parikar. He said, General Sahib, what did you say? I said, does he mean it? I, and I was a core commander, it has to be told to chief. It, I said, sir, sagar na maite, sagar na maite, tu me aapla kaam kara. I said, thik hai, then we spoke and we made our plans and this thing. I said, sir, how much time? I asked my bosses also, chief had come. He said, jaldi se jaldi, we had to finish it off fast. So then, you know, it's a very complex operation. It's not, you know, just go and strike and come. It, it requires a lot of planning and all. But as I said, luckily we are ahead of the curve. And we said, okay, we'll do it. And such a kind of operation, there are three things important. The first and major thing is surprise and deception. If it is not there, you can never succeed in this kind of operations. And the biggest guru for this surprise of such kind of operation was none other than Shatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. You see, Anywhere he did, he's used this to the greatest extent, right from any, any incident you take where he succeeded was surprise and deception. Now, how did we have a surprise and deception? In this case, at the highest level was deception. Now, if you go back and see those news and TV news that time, there was a big talk on abrogation of Indus Treaty. And everybody thought because of this, now, action taken will be Indus Water Treaty will be abrogated. And uh, Prime Minister also gave a statement to this effect. On 29th September, there was supposed to be a press conference at 10 o'clock. And all people were called. And they thought that you know, everybody was prepared. You know, they all journalists prepared what questions should be on Indus Water Treaty 60, what happened, how to do, if abrogated, what will happen. And suddenly the DGMO, you see, remember that Sardarji came on the air. He said, we have carried out surgical strike. Firstly, they were all floored. Journalists didn't know firstly what is surgical and see who, who, kya to, hum to tayar ho ke indus water treaty ke laya the, aur a surgical strike bata diya kya. Then it was told that we did, did, did this thing. And why I'm saying it's a master deception stroke, which was at the highest level. <laughs> Second was at a tactical level. In mine, you can say little operational level, so bigger than ground. We did not tell anyone. When we carry out such a thing, you know, as a senior officer in our house, proper operation room is there. Nobody's allowed to go, even my wife or so. Nobody, except me, nobody goes there. So that day, that night, I used to go inside, come out, because see what is happening. And surprise has to be maintained. You can't keep on communicating all the time. Because if there is an increase in traffic, radio traffic, and line of control, we are, you know, okay, there is something wrong. So therefore, we only has to do the regular traffic, which every day happens. And therefore, we has to insert certain code words, only that was allowed. That was another part. In the house, nobody came to know. In fact, so much so that, you know, we have a standard operating procedure. If I am in charge of a particular thing, and if I die, or something happens to me, then my 2IC has to take over, so he has to be in picture. So my 2IC was a major general, 
I, he was not told. Because anywhere the news can go. So next day when I was watching a TV, having a cup of coffee in my office, seeing the I knew and what all happened, he came running, sir, you are in your area, what happened? So I smiled and told him, you are showing, what happened? You know? <laughs> so this was a you know, degree of surprise which uh, we had. And third, and most important, was tactical. The men who were on the ground, they were not told what was their target till right till last. They practiced similarly how to go so much. But they also, nobody thought, you know, our, the porters we they generally mill around. So nobody thought it will. And Pakistani never thought. They thought that infiltration is their prerogative. We Indians so karina sakte. So that was a very, very big surprise, you know. Passive kind of a surprise. And they did not know. The teams which were supposed out of 17 which I had, three teams were told you will go this, this, this. Last moment when they are taken for the infiltration. So here, all our parameters were met. Next is timing. When do you carry out such an attack? We are given earliest, it was told. Now, in any kind of operation in the armed forces, the moon plays a great part. And you see, if you go on to the colloquially, in our religion, it is said that this amount of work is not abshakun. You have to do this amount of work. I said that in the army, the amount of work is not abshakun. I said that in the army, the amount of work is not abshakun. If you are not abshakun, then you can be very sure that you are going to win. And why I say that a trained soldier takes the advantage of darkness and gets the better of the enemy. So 29, 28, 29 was nearly new moon day, nearly. The bulk of the night was dark night. And this again, I said, Chhatrapati Shivaji, see how he used the uh, moon. I'll give you an example of uh, Sihagad. He captured on 8th, 9th day, Shuddha, Naomi, Ashtami Naomi. Now, he says, Kish, he was there and uh, Tanaji's son's marriage, Adi Lagin, Pundanache, Magrai. See, if he was not an um, incompassionate in or mechanical man, he had feelings. But why did he insist? He would have delayed. If Rai was Lagin had to be done, he would have delayed by another month. What was the problem? But he did not, because that was required to be captured earliest, because of the conditions. And if he did not attack on this day, eight, nine day, then further month away he would have to do it. And God only knows what the changes were. And why? Because first part of the night, first if you see that moon then, first part of the night it was moonlit night. Moon was up. And therefore any approach of the raiding party has to be done in moon. It, it, no, it is easier. They can go faster. And the actual fighting, climbing is to be done in dark. And the latter part was dark. And therefore, they succeeded in surprise as well as using the moon properly. So accordingly, we also were very lucky. We got a dark night for this. And it's very important. Second is D HR. When do you strike a target? Now, you must have seen the movie, Uri, the surgical strike, you know. The intelligence gathering is by some Garud, you know, that uh, bird he goes or some raw agent. Then nothing happened, no, nothing like this. <laughs> it was all we knew. Everything was known to us, all input we had. And not only now, we knew exactly where the camps, we knew exactly where the routes, you know, how do you come, who are the sentries, everything we knew. So those things, of course, they are for uh, the Mirch Masala of the movie. and. Uh, like uh, they say ki the, uh, the one girl, no, or the female briefing and doing everything. So, uh, I mean, jokingly saying that I'm just army man, netta wagera se kya kam karat nahi. They fakt the chitra pada dakhwala sth. But this was actually to give a kind of a, you know, a little bit. Otherwise, it would have become a documentary, and therefore, uh, so we had knowledge of everything, and we had. At least my three teams, I was not bothered about others because I was more interested in success of my teams. I said, you will strike the HR, I tell you. 
And I want to now confess here, in the armed forces, we are actually secular. There's no pseudo-secularism. We respect each and every religion. And this terrorist, we knew they are all Islamist. And that day, 29th of September, uh, was the first namaz, what is it called Fazar ka namaz, was at four, past, five minutes past four. And I said everything has to be done before four or five. And we, I, we require about 14 to 15 minutes on target. And if you calculate that, I said, then your HR, the striking is, has to be about 3.30. And in that movie, again, they say that some chap is searching for two hours or some, some fellow. We don't have that much of liberty. You have to go there, strike, do what you want to do, and come back fastest. So we had selected 3, 3.32 as HR, I still remember. And uh, then came the most important thing, like actual execution on the ground. Actually, execution on the ground, that is the most important thing. Because all this thing, if you don't execute it properly, then all your planning and everything, surprise, everything goes for a sex. So that day, we did not go in by helicopters or something. We were on the line of control. And line of control is a very peculiar thing. Distance between two posts is around 100, 150, somewhere about 300, depending on the terrain conditions. And in amongst this, there is a minefield laid in since 1947, no what, and it kept on adding. So you yourself don't know where the mines are. So how do you avoid this problem? So to our safety as a core commander, I ordered everyone that you must know what are the minefield lanes. These are the ones where the mines are not there. So there is a simple solution to it. The monkeys which are there, they don't follow any LC. No? From Pakistan, they come to India. India, they go to Pakistan, POK. So we used to follow this movement of the monkeys and take the bearings. And almost all of our posts, they knew exactly. And we got something called wire, black wire, no? Telephone wire. So I told them, lay this wire quietly. So by about three-fourths of the distance, they already laid. They knew exactly kaha pe mine hai, kaha pe nahi hai. So that was another which was there. Or also sometimes, these donkeys came, or the uh, dogs came. So that helped us to know where the mine uh, are not there. So, but notwithstanding this, when we entered, infiltrated, for that 150 meters to 200 meters distance, each of our team took at least about an hour and a half. But the moment we reached past the minefield, we know our three, four, I was quite certain now our job is done. Now nobody can stop us from this thing. We achieved surprise, we have gone, this thing, everything was done. Second thing in planning which we had done, we were told that not to take more than 24 people. But I took, I told them not less than 35 people. And why it was that? It was a risk because more the people, detection chances are more. But we have got ethos in the Indian Army. That if something happens to our colleague in the enemy territory, then we can't leave him behind. If he's killed, we have to pick him up. If he's injured, we have to pick him up. Now, if you take only 20 people, you know, if he's injured and carrying about three, four kilometers, I, I can tell you it's not a joke. It's very, very difficult. So I said that at least seven teams are required to relay, 7 into 4, 28, and the rest of the things sent to Sally. So seven teams were required, so you have about 200, so at least they can relay, but if you only 20, then how, how will you do? So for that, in, to the risk of failure, we said that we'll take 36, as though of course it was debated, but finally it was agreed to. We went there, right in time, I got a code word, when nothing you could do, you only said yes, go ahead, because the job of a commander is like a non-playing captain. You see those FIFA World Cup, no, that chap is running up and down. No, he could do nothing. Only chance you have to do are the players on the ground. So the code word was given. Now is the how do you, you know, <coughs> activate your raid? Now, if you see, there are about three to four sentries on each camp. Now, there are two ways of killing these sentries. 
they had silenced weapon either you can fire but whatever silence sir you use it still makes noise no so therefore second was our people are trained to silence the sentry that is by physical means so you go with your knives crawl up to that chap and cut their heads so they don't make any noise so all my means all our parties they went there quietly they were very successful they silenced all the sentries and then again the siege was given and as i said we were there for on the target for 12 minutes we fired everything we had and again hats off to our hierarchy our uh, defense minister he had given us whatever we wanted three days. we wanted bullet proof jackets light one we wanted thermal imagers we wanted good uh, wireless communication set with the security we wanted better we had given travis weapons which were of the israeli origin we are given the best of the bayonets which do cut the heads no so everything was available then when you get everything your half the job is done so f- therefore we are always grateful to mr parikar again <laughs> so <laughs> there it was that we went carried out in 12 minutes whatever we had to fire everything is disposable rockets everything we fired and then there is something in the planning stage itself there is very peculiar thing happened the chief was sir uh, suhag he had told us to tell your teams to videograph everything we had a uav in the air force had provided their uav is permanently going but they could not photograph properly this the uav is are the uh, unmanned aerial vehicles the big ones if they go bird they were keeping an eye on enemy aircrafts and everything so that no they can take care and also if need be they were supposed to guide us and all but uh, need did not arrive we are told that whatever you do you videograph everything now see when you go on the ground go inside now there are a lot of complex things you don't have a liberty is like that no filming karo so i was quite worried and i was disturbed also why why should we there is what is the need so nahi nahi to ye hukum hai no what me then there is nothing after that hukum hai to hukum hai then you have to do. but then in the hindsight i thought it is a very good thing which has happened because after the strike was done there are number of people's political leaders they said ki ye to surgical strike to hua hi nahi hai and then we had the cds there only two of them one was the director general of military operation one was our headquarters the rest all we had destroyed and after three years i think the government showed what all has happened and on the slide which uh, what all we did and uh, we came back coming back was very fast because from the moment you come to your home you know come fastest we came and there we used the helicopters to pick the boys and get them into their units fastest and three chaps in the helicopter they came to me showed me whatever they filmed we calculated counted and uh, generally 15 core and 16 core both together we found that we had killed about 82 terrorist and uh, the biggest thing was not a single casualty of our own troops i think that was the biggest thing so in nutshell this was a surgical how it happened and now people ask why hey, you had done a surgical strike no number of when like lectures you have like this and people with a malicious intention yes this yes. will the terrorism stop it will never if somebody wants to come and die you cannot stop him i'll give you example you go take your mind back in 1973 there was attack in munich on israeli athletes they were killed and they were by a group of uh, terrorists called black september gorillas now after this israel for 4 to 5 years they killed everyone now did terrorism stop against israel no it did not but it put a fear of god into them that if you do something you will get a slap now here i am again pardon me i am not a Uh, propagator of uh, no once you are hit on one face you so you know the dusra kalpan pude i i said if you hit me 
I will hit you with two. Why I say this? Because, and they say, okay, you know, this will happen, ki eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, make the whole world blind. No, if you take, if you take my eye, I will take two of yours. And then, next time, if he wants to take my eye, he will be ten times careful. Whether the whole world goes, he does, he is not bothered. But he is bothered, muze ne yandhauna chi. So therefore, there is no question of this thing. You have to be ready to fight for your rights. That is my personal uh, philosophy of against Ainsa. So, uh, it, it did not. So then the second thing was, then only they used to ask me, can we do it again? So I said, why not? So I, they said, Okay, how will you do it? I said, that I cannot tell you. <laughs> you know, and you find in February 19, again thing happened. The Bala code happened. And why did it happen? How we are so confident? See, after this, when we entered, and it's a kind of a signal to war. How did you get away from it? All the international governments, USA, UK, Russia, you see there France, you see their statement. This, they never condemned us for going and striking. They only said, exercise restraint. That, of course, we will exercise. There is no problem. Do not let it escalate. So we are ready for escalation. It's up to them whether to want to escalate. But tacitly, it was agreed that what you have done is correct. And therefore, the seeds of success of Balakut were in this. And when next time, it's a more complex thing. Here at least you go and come back, you can deny, you can do. but the moment you take an aircraft, it's an act of war. But we still took a chance, took a, government took a decision that we will teach them a lesson, and we did that. That was a very, very, and see, the strike at Balakot is exactly two minutes flying away time from the target from Rahul Pindi. So we showed the Pakistan that in spite of your radars, we could, Breach your radar system, strike your target. We struck Balakot, we could have struck Rahul Pindi also. So this was a message loud and clear given to them. And biggest thing is that the license has been given by the international community to us. If something happens to terrorism, we can do this. Now the people again ask me, hey, can you do it third time? I still say yes. It can be done, but not a machism, but it will take a different form. And that is left to your guess what all we can do. <laughs> but I can assure you, the people will be successful. And finally, before concluding my surgical strike lecture, I said I felt, or most of us felt bad. The whole nation was patting us. We had good job done. Nice, Every, everybody was happy, the entire nation was in euphoria. People say, yes, we also can do something like the foreign army does. There are two or three chaps, you know, this, as I said, a huayni. Like one is, of course, the famous Mr. Kejriwal, and uh, one is, uh, one MP here only, I think he was Sivshena, uh, Sanjay Nirupam. He is the very vocal about all these things, you know. So we said, Ki, this is not a Pakistani, this is your army. No, you be proud of that army. What we tell you is correct. Do not have you know, any doubts over us. If there are something wrong, we'll tell you. And believe in us. Now, tomorrow, maybe not, we are the nation's army. If you are in power, we'll also do the same thing for you. For the nation, not for you, for the nation. And we'll succeed. And therefore, this was the only black lining on the everything successful which was carried on. So, that was a surgical sign and its effect. Uh, now is the important thing. What another factor which helps is the creation of theater commands. Now, what is the theater command? Theater command means all resources of air, na uh, naval component, an armed component placed under one commander. And he carries out operational planning, gets approval from chief of defense staff and minister, and the, after the government, and carries out strike. He doesn't have to bother about his own chief or something. You know, it is all tailor-made. This we also followed 
on the lines of uh, United States state, and I'm quite certain that this will be very successful. See, give an example. In Mumbai, we have got Navy, we have got Army, we have got some Air Force component also. Now, everybody has got logistics, he has got supplies. Army has his own, Navy has his own. When you combine, you imagine you saved the resources on two. So likewise, this is one small example, so many will be saved. And overall, operational efficiency will increase and we will never face a situation like Kargil again, where we did not have a synergy. So that was inter theater command. Now, I think uh, I'll take the questions. There are two, three things which are there that can be answered in the form of questions and answers. And I'll, I'll be most open. You can ask me anything. And whatever little I know and whatever I express, I'll try and give the straight answers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I enjoyed giving the lecture. I hope you also enjoyed the same. Thank you. So, sir, uh, you know, just continuing on the last part that you said, uh, and uh, because theaterization of the armed forces is a, a new concept or at least a term for many of us, uh, one, uh, what are the real pros and cons? Because there must be some pros and cons of something like this. Uh, and second, uh, why has it taken longer to implement? And is any one wing of the R forces a bit more pro-theaterization. Uh, there are reports that maybe the Navy and Air Force may not be liking it. So your comments on all of that. See, you are absolutely right. If you see the genesis of this in the United States Armed Forces also, I said nobody liked it because Navy was having its own domain. You know, they were on the waves of Pacific and Atlantic and all over the world. The Army had different capabilities, Air Force used to think everybody is a top gun. You know, so they, they had their own domains. So therefore, they did not want. But subsequently, what had happened? Uh, we'll take an example of US PACOM, US Pacific Command, which is there in, headquartered in uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii Island. <coughs> so now the dominant force is Navy there. And the commander, theater commander, is a naval commander. But under him, are the Air Force and the Army component, called United States Army Pacific. And they, other, they have no choice. The Chief of Army Staff of the United States uh, is only concerned about giving the logistic support, nothing else. The entire operational, everything is done by the theater commander. And it has worked very well. Because if now, if any, anywhere you go, they are having men, everything at their disposal all the time. The similar thing will happen. I ex just oppose this on uh, Kargil operations. Now suppose a Northern Army commander would have been a theater commander. He had his own air force. Navy, of course, will not be under him because he's out of his purview. There is no sea or coastline there. But with his resources, with air resources, I am sure that the results which have been much better, much smoother. Also, the money which is spent. Now, I'll, I'll just give an example is that Army wants a separate transport wing, air wing. Air Forces puts its foot down, no, no, we'll run. And who, sir, has got the influence with the government, it gets it. Last General Bikram Singh got his own air arm for transport. Now, there is a lot of duplication and triplication in this. Now, if it is under the theater commander, whether it is belongs to Air Force or Army, it all belongs to that theater. So, they will all be finished. Now, there is something called uh, medium range surface to air missiles, MRS. And each regiment costs around 22,000 crore rupees. Now, Air Force wants it separately, Army wants it separately. Now, now they have understood. We say any air defense activity is the role of Air Force. 
and close defense is the role of army. Now, theater commander now he knows, okay, this entire thing is mine. So, he will put his MR Sams, etc. So, suffice to say, long and short of it, it has got a tremendous amount of uh, um, advantages as compared to cons. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, a question from the audience. Uh, how has the inclusion of both the NSA and the CDS uh, changed the overall approach of defense in India? Uh, see, NSA was always there. What infusion has occurred is of chief of defense staff. Now, before chief of defense staff, what is to happen? There is something called chiefs of staff committee. And by rotation, it is to be either admiral or a air chief marshal or a chief of army staff. By rotation, they used to have this thing. And I have worked in such an organization. I find that it is just a, I mean, organization which had no teeth. Every, I mean, everybody should do his own. So when this uh, Subramanian Committee report came in, they had proposed CDS. That is in 2002. But again, uh, it was scuttled mainly by, and I am very frank about it, it was scuttled by our bureaucrats. <laughs> because the moment the CDS came, then what are the roles? What will the Defense Secretary do? Everything is under him. So it was scuttled and they got something called Integrated Defense Staff. And Integrated Headquarters of Army, Navy, Air Force, no integrate. What was the integration? It was the same thing, but the name only changed. So it was fooling the nation. And everybody got fooled. Oh, everything is integrated. There's nothing integrated. And then, when the present government came, there were a lot of uh, uh, discussions, arguments, etc. And it was decided the CDS will come. And the first CDS came, and there was a running fight now. Because again the CDS come, what is, what is, whose domain it will be? The IS officer did not want to lose their uh, thing. And till the time General Rawat was there, he was very clued up as to how to deal with these people. So he managed well. The moment he was gone, again it slumped back. The present CDS has half of his powers have been taken away. So I am afraid that again he should not go back to integrated defense system tha, unless somebody powerful is there. So it is a good thing. It should happen provided we don't bow down to the machinations of the bureaucrats. And I am very, very strongly feeling about it. Uh, sir, uh, you know, you spoke about, I think, uh, uh, you know, what did one surgical strike do or what did the second surgical strike do? But I think overall in terms of uh, uh, our positioning with our neighbors, I think while that dealt a little bit with Pakistan, uh, especially on China, uh, A, what happened in Galwan, and second, again, do you think we've got at least some of our posture right there or what else do you think we need to do uh, to stop China from having more ambitions? Okay, I, I'll, I'll make the stand of uh, army clear. All this haziness must get clarified. Let's take our mind back. You know, uh, in 2017, Doklam happened. Now, Doklam happened and, uh, you know, it continued for 53 days. So, I, I still remember those days. We require about 25,000 troops to be pumped in there. And if you see that area, it is like a sack. As I said, Chumbi Valley, it's like a sack. And everybody says, Ki, okay, that chicken snake will be cut and everything. But there is something else which we have, which uh, I will, sorry, I will not say. It's not in the open domain. What we can do. And that, those preparation we started doing, in fact, uh, I was a MGO is responsible for giving all this equipment, clothing, etc. So once one day night, this chap, uh, CDS asked me, he used to go, go, we are very good friends. So he said, Nimbu, you have a set of 25,000 clothing. So I said, sir, you told me before, don't do overstock. But fortunately, I had kept this reserve. I said, hey. So to cut the story short, we had taken appropriate measure and the Chinese backed out. They did not back out just because they were benevolent to us. 
they knew something else was coming and if that would have happened china would have lost its head and respect in the international community so that was doklam and galwan is a thing which actually to be very frank is blown out of proportion so this thing actually kept on happening earlier also we used to go we used to plant our flag way inside they used to come and they used to continue here of course we took a stand and you know what all happened and there was a fixation of positions but after galwan the action which we did caught china by surprise and thereafter you find nothing has happened and what was that action the action of going and occupying kailash range we we in a, when we go ahead all in our courses we keep on learning occupy the area as i was saying that occupy minimal same thing happened we went and occupied very meticulously planned operation and we sat down there and chinese did not know and therefore the truce or something came out they vacated some post we also agreed for something and finally we did agree to withdraw from kailash range but situation by and large ex barring or two three places by and large has stabilized uh, so you mentioned uh, that you know the incident got blown a little bit out of proportion so there's a question again from the audience and i'd like to take that uh, what do you feel uh, about the role of media the courts sometimes the opposition parties especially when it comes to matters of defense or it comes to matters of defense procurement say like the rafal deal see as, as i said uh, you all know and uh, that media has to be very responsible no it doesn't matter when you report on a political situation or you know uh, daily happenings in uh, day to day life but when it comes to the question of national security it has to be more responsible so you can't play to the gallery now i'll give one example six month junior to me a friend of mine who is a famous uh, uh, journalist now is ajay shukla you must have heard his name he writes as a broad sword but if you see his writings they are all loaded in fear you can the moment you read you know who has given him told him to write this so this kind of a journalism actually you know takes away the real thing you know real job what you want to do and then you are left to fire fight thank you example of rafel and again as i said in this house itself i'll give the clear picture on the rafel how it was reported different matter now rafel deal was signed in 2009 i think it was for 570 crores or something and then in 2017 16 17 it was yeah. again activated and the cost came to 1460 or something now people say wo oh, 570 ka 1400 हो गया देखो द गवर्नमेंट ने क्या कर दिया ऐसे ऑल 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 आर मीडिया फ्रेंड्स वी आर बाउंसिंग ऑन द गवर्नमेंट एंड द आर्म फोर्सेस दिस इज रॉन्ग ना आई एल टेल यू इफ यू से इन नाइन और सेवन इयर्स शू द इन्फ्लेशन इन्फ्लेशन इन शू डेट के फाइव सेवेंटी वुड कॉस्ट अबाउट फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड इन एनी केस इट वॉज मच मोर सेकेंड सी द वैल्यू ऑफ डॉलर what was the value of dollar in 2009 what was the value of dollar in 2017 you take that into calculation so again in it is there third and most important thing which is not come in the papers and some people got the wind of it they luckily not published it is that when in 2009 we had a sales agreement with france we were only taking uh, spares for 2 years and when 2017 when you took, took the spares for four years you all own cars you know the market and repairs and expenditure is in spares so you already had double the amount of spares which supposed to do. and there are some other thing add ons which are again ave and x wagera wagera which were there in the rafale and the last thing is that this was agreement government to government so therefore no question of uh, any bribery or something if at all any bribe is putting is taken by the government it is given by the government <laughs> so 
So this was <laughs> not happening. Uh, so speaking of neighbors, uh, two questions again, uh, and we have a, a, a photograph of the gentleman on the backdrop. But uh, what do you think prompted Pakistan uh, to return Wing Commander Abhinandan? You see, there are many theories uh, which is, uh, he was pressurized, uh, Imran Khan was pressurized or this thing. Uh, to my mind, what had happened, the Pakistan did this thing, played wrong earlier also and now also. You see, in the surgical strike, there was one soldier who was captured. He was from Maharashtra only. And he was, he, he belonged to my corps, you know, 16 corps. And uh, he went across, it's a big story which we gave, actual story is different. <laughs> and, but the thing is, Malia Lodi who was a Ambassador, Pakistan Ambassador, she already declared that we have a soldier from the surgical strikes. So firstly, she confirmed that surgical strikes have taken place. <laughs> and second, she confirmed the soldier is with us. Now she cannot kill that soldier. He has to be returned back. So after four or five months, he was returned back. So a, they did a very, very stupid mistake. If they would have like uh, our, uh, another friend of ours who is rotting in Pakistan, Mic off. Oh, there is a friend who is uh, in the jail, Jadav, is, uh, from Satara, he is somewhere in this area. He, this, that time they did not make this mistake. And uh, when Abhinandan was uh, down by their missile, and it was shown everywhere, no, in the TV, there, this thing, that has been captured. Now, whether they return him after three days or three months, they would have had to return him. So, if you have to return subsequently, why not return now? And gain mileage out of it. So, that was the thing, which is... Uh, sir, I think, uh, since you spoke a lot about our ability now, uh, what do you think stops us from taking POK back today? See, uh, any op, any action which you have to take, it should not be coming out of machoism or jingoism. It has to be well thought out. Firstly, you have to see our main objective. Do we require POK? What is the need of it? Okay, so for a psychological reason, I mean, if I, I am a leader and I, and I will never take POK, I said, let them go to hell. <laughs> no, but suppose psychology is my land and I will not part with it. You have to take it. There is a psychological feeling attached to it. The whole landmass of India says, okay, every inch of Kashmir mere paas mein hona so we can take it. But for everything, for every action, you have to pay a price. Now, how much of price you have to pay? No, that you have to decide. I can safely say, that yes, we can take POK, but the price will be heavy. So, uh, moving a little, because we are talking about uh, our preparedness going forward, uh, you know, especially in terms of modern warfare. So, uh, you know, there's a question uh, from the audience again. Uh, you know, what are the advantages and the threats of incorporating things like artificial intelligence into modern warfare techniques. Uh, so I think something on that and, and how are we modernizing our army with some of those techniques? Okay, I, I, th I think a good question and we are also actually groping in dark about this, what is going to be a future. You know, people like us who now we are after retired, you know, just seeing and analyzing and studying on this. See, uh, in 1994, you know, uh, America started, so they had a coined a terminal called revolution in military affairs or revolution in military technology. And then they decided to cut their army and they call it army after next. You know, suddenly there's so many two lakh soldiers would be cut. And uh, they decided that technology will take care of it. But subsequent actions showed 
that this was not a wise thing now if you, if there is number of people here number of thinkers number of ex army officers security expert also saying that the indian army needs to be cut by 2 lakhs because our budget is 82 billion out of that you know uh, 41 billion dollars are given to the indian army out of that 81% is given for pay and allowances so leaving only hardly anything but you have to be little cautious in a sense say okay the counter to that is that we have to have a, a capability of blue water navy you go far project yourself you deny the slack sea lanes of communication of china from malacca strait and indonesia strait and there uh, about 64% of the oil of china flows through this and therefore you block they will come to stand still this will not happen you know you block 64% do you mean to say he'll, he will die he will find his ways and means uh, this thing so just by saying that we will only have a naval arm and a air force supporting it from masira on the western side and nicobar on the eastern side you have to be balanced and finally you can't do away with foot soldiers because wherever you see even in even in the gulf war after bombing after doing everything finally the man had to go on foot if you don't have a foot soldier you're not going to succeed i am quite clear about it china has got 9 lakh 50 thousand soldiers we got 12 50 thousand divided into eastern northern western sub all this thing but see our commitments in jnk alone today there are 63 battalions of rr that makes about 63 thousand troops only for internal security can you do away with this you can't so you have to, you have to have a balanced approach in everything how do you uh, no um, give to army navy air force and i have generally diverged a little bit your question was your ai cyber it is really scary if they show and on the ground what they what they show happens then i am afraid uh, the things war fighting will change very very drastically and uh, i have seen on the ground also demo because i interact with the industry i am also doing lot of uh, uh, advisory work to maharashtra chamber of commerce so what the capabilities do show I, i think then we have to take into consideration and this will change the entire gamut of fighting war fighting on, on that a related question sir uh, but uh, you know there's lot said and uh, seen about drones uh so what do you think is the role of drones in the future of uh, armed forces uh see drones and uh, it's a, it's a evolving thing firstly we used to in, i had mentioned we only were for the surveillance that uav used to fly in the sky or something we used to have you no know. but today the drone is for lot of things and uh, when this uh, kailash range occupation was going on we found that no we can't take the mules now how do you take for such a long distance they are you no know, interfered by the enemy then how do you do so that time the indian army started scouting for logistic drones the drones which can carry 40 kg at about 20000 feet and you no know, replenish ammunition arms water food so if you have this kind of a thing i connect you with the second question i will take pok very easily provided i also stop his drones you know so the drone warfare gives us tremendous amount of opportunity tremendous amount of for food soldiers and um, it's not only logistic drones you have surveillance drones as i said you have swarms of drones like you have 100 drones coming in each one is fed are different characteristic they'll come and hit each one of you so that way you know see the potential which uh, is there then after swarms you have a counter swarm drones we got a loitering ammunition this is all available in india today and therefore our power will go multifold provided the enemy also doesn't get it as far as china is concerned they have a technical cap- capability so we have to uh, find ways and means to do this thing like um, like i was saying that in 62 we saying we are worried about lucknow and calcutta being bombed now we have got a capability of uh, 
destroying the bridges and the dams on Sangpo. Sangpo is Brahmaputra which flows down there. We can very easily do it. Shouldn't he be worried? He is worried. So, it is not that China now feels it is like we can go walk over to through Tawang and go to Tejpur or no, uh, Leh, Ladakh and come to Leh and we'll knock off everything in collision with Pakistan. It's not so easy. And he also knows it. Thanks, sir. Sir, in your previous answer, you actually spoke about the size of the army and that brings us to an important question, which is the whole Agnivir scheme. So, one, your view on why was there a necessity to have an alternative scheme of recruitment and some of the features, pros and cons of the Agnivir scheme. See, uh, there has been a lot. Okay? Yeah. And, uh, lot been said about Agnivirs. Now, to my mind, as a senior army commander, which I retired, and as an infantry officer, I find this is an excellent scheme being perpetrated by the government. A lot of my friends themselves, they say, no, you are not being, you know, honest to your profession and not saying. I am honest to my profession. I know what exactly what I mean. See what happens. I will give you an example. Infamy, Tushar is here. He, he will vouch for it. See, when he is commanded the battalion, we have around 740 people. And we have a system of staying for two and a half years to three years in peace and then going to field. Whenever you go to field, say we go to high altitude area, you require a fit, able-bodied soldier. Now, out of the 740, you no, know, barring various duties and all, you always find there are 140 to 150 people who are low medical categories. Now, imagine the plight of that CEO. He has to take those many from other units. He doesn't know them. They don't gel well. And there is a lot of man management problem. So, vis-a-vis, -vis, if you got this all able-bodied people, when I go on the line of control or on uh, uh, in, insurgency uh, or in Siachin or in, this is good to me. This is one, one example. Second is, it is not, everything is not hunked over in the armed forces. See, the man who has commanded a battalion, he knows, it's so difficult. You know, there are at least about 50 to 60 chaps who are in discipline cases. Everybody says army is good, discipline, it's not so. I, I'll be very candid. There are a lot of indiscipline But I am a father of the unit. Now I had to see, isko mein nikal dunga, to iske family ka kya hoga? So we are very humanitarian. Oh, Jesse also comes up, iske pit pe lat maro, pet pe mat maro. But how do you handle him? Core reading entries, fire reading entries, indiscipline chap. But you still have to carry on. So this baggage you have to carry on. Now, the moment that Agnivir knows that I'll be off. He doesn't get to this thing. You know, so that is second. Third is all youthfulness and if an 18 year fellow goes in the army, he stays for five years. Even if he has to go, he learns various skills and there are reservations for job. If he is not a spent thrift, he can easily save for about 22 lakhs that I calculated and he can put it in various and in various, he can do a job and entrepreneur, whatever is the thing. Otherwise, he would have been there, no, running behind the political leaders and going there and the Yatras and at least here, there, 22 lakhs he gets. <laughs> and after a lot of coaxing, though it is not truth, it is not out, but uh, again in this hall only, probably 50% uh, of the Agni will be retained as against it was 25% earlier. Wow. Uh, but please don't quote me in this. <laughs> sure, sir. So, uh, since you spoke so fondly about uh, Parikar, sir, I think this audience and Brabodhan Mancha has a special connection to him. He tried to solve one long-standing issue, uh, the OROP. Uh, do you think it is solved? See, I am not a mathematician. <laughs> but whenever I go to play golf, my old officers are there, you know, seniors, my reward, we play with them. So once you can then draw your own He says, Arab, itna paisa milte pada nahi kya kare. I think my answer is that. Uh, again, sir, uh, you know, I think you, you spoke about internal security, but one of the things which is sometimes a concern is the fact that, and you mentioned about 63,000 soldiers in, in Kashmir on internal security. So, A, is the Indian Army 
overused in internal security? Uh, and what do you think should or could the role be if it has to be different? Okay, there is a force called Russia Rifles, which will be purely meant for uh, internal security or counter-terrorism. And as I said, in Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, there are 63 battalions. And this problem is always faced. Ki should we reduce? Are there war Firstly, they are not overused. If you see a battalion or one who is posted there, he doesn't go in the operation every day. Uh, maybe uh, you know, one unit, once in six months he goes into the operation. But yes, he has to be alert. To that extent, he, he is fatigued. No doubt about it. It's not so easy as we say, though he doesn't go under the bullet and but he's fatigued. There is a lot of pressure on him to perform, a lot of pressure on him to survive, a lot of pressure on the officer to um, handle his men. So it is not easy. But saying that it's overused, I, I don't think so. It is not overused. And can you reduce? No. Uh, I, as, a, as a 16th Corps commander, I had uh, 32 battalions of RR. And every time, the people used to come and they say, I used to say, no, they cannot be reduced. You ask a person, you know, he says, no, how can I survive with these people? So there is, and now of course they have agreed that six, these 63 battalions are required. If you have to send. And of course, now 370, 370 has been abrogated. Slowly and slowly, it's not like a button, no? you put a button and light will come on. It takes time. Slowly and slowly it will happen. But happen it will, the peace will return to the valley. That I am very sure. But you cannot reduce these people. Immediately, maybe in the long run. Uh, so, uh, you know, the world has probably seen, uh, after a long time, a very long drawn out war. Uh, so, any lessons for India from the Ukraine Russia conflict or any of the more recent uh, conflicts happening internationally? See, firstly, only we should take about the Ukraine Russia war. The first and foremost lesson, which comes very loud and clear. Is the question is the question you asked me first? Can you reduce a foot soldier? You cannot. The primacy of an infantry soldier is there, and you have to be very well motivated. Come what may, you have various kind of technology, and subsequently that's a Wagner fellow. He is there on the ground. He only hold the thing, or if he goes back. So therefore, the primacy of infantry will have to be always kept in mind. Secondly, the future of the tank is a little doubtful. Now we have got such a vast uh, land borders where the tanks are used in the Chinese. But as you said, with the efficacy of drone going up, I am not sure, you will have to wait and watch. But I think the primacy of the tank warfare is going to dwindle. If subsequently, now you see in Ukraine, Russia, where hardly any tanks are used. Earlier, everything, whole line was by the tanks. Now when you see so many have been destroyed, they don't know what to do. So therefore, second is this. And third is your drones. They are going to be a major, major role in this. And uh, of course, combined with uh, AI and all, uh, it's a very, very formidable technological warfare which is going to happen in the next century. Uh, so uh, overall, A, in terms of a defense strategy, and second, in terms of the cohesion between the various arms of the government, which includes intelligence as well as uh, the seamless integration with the defense forces. How is it, uh, your thoughts on how it should change or, or if it is good enough? See, uh, the mismatch uh, between uh, the intelligence and the man operating on the ground, uh, is, it, it was there. So it is in our own, own interest to have integrated efforts of various agencies. See, intelligence agencies, by their very nature, are very, very comfortable in operating there in their silos. I have got information of something I will not share with you. So you know, if you want my country, it is my domain, I feel. So therefore, this silos and you know, wall has to be broken. I don't know how the, this thing is there, because it will give us a tremendous amount of divisions. See, uh, I remember uh, when we were operating, say, at a various level, say, say, Jammu and Kashmir. Now, I have a source. Source is a chap whom we get information from. So, the army fellow has got the same source. Army intelligence has got the same source. IB also has got the same source. That chap gives a different uh, 
information to this thing. He asked from all of us. I will not tell you this stuff is my source. But the moment if it had told, then would have known, and they wouldn't have fooled all of us. So these kind of things are there. But having said that, it is very difficult to have integration and seamless. They will always work like this. It's not only in India. It happens everywhere in the world. Even to the best of the security agency, a uh, lot of uh, I have. Um, done a lot of courses with the Israelis for about a year in the United States. They also have the same problem. So it has to be, how do you make, make the best of, use of it? That we'll have to see. One thing which was there and we missed out on a great opportunity <coughs> is that there was in the armed forces a technical support division was formed. And it came under a lot of flag. But if you'd have you know, seen the light of the day, we would have killed a number of terrorists because I was the one who was seeing and I was hampered by the intelligence which there. And again, all due respects to all agencies, all our troops were operating in the ground. They never got any information from IB. They'll say, Aaj 15 idhar kuch hone wala hai. Now that everybody knows 15 hoga. <laughs> so this kind of a generic information, police says, be, be little careful. Ye char jaga se infiltration wala. Humko pata isi char jaga se aur kaha hai. <laughs> so this kind of a things are there. Uh, so, sir, uh, coming to maybe a policy level thing, but uh, do you think that the overall governance, because in terms of securing our national interest and in terms of the overall people's needs, should the armed forces be made an integral part of decision making when it comes to anything related to national security? See, uh, now, internal security duties, especially hard internal security duties, have, have become the second duty of the armed forces. So therefore, if that be the case, if they are responsible, if they are accountable, they are also should be authorized in the decision making. That uh, goes without saying. That must, must be done. But it has to be taken in the pinch of salt. As they, this, you know, old adage, they say political, Politics is too complex a subject to be left to the generals alone. <laughs> so they should be made a part of it. So they, they should know. But to what extent? That should be. But they should know. This input should be taken. I'll, I'll give one example. At a smaller scale. In 2012 and 13, I was a, a GOC of Hector Force, which is responsible South Kashmir entity and conduct smooth conduct of Amarnath Yatra. And any security related issue used to be addressed, it had to be addressed by me. But the police was not under me. They will not tell me anything. The CRPA was not there. But if anything goes wrong, you are responsible. So therefore, with, I, I got fed up and told the governor, I said, you take me from here, I am not going to, either they tell me or I am not responsible. So, Responsibility and knowledge and decision making go together. So therefore, the answer is yes, they should be at for a particular duration or maybe a required duration. So this is, and we're moving maybe to the last two questions that we have. This one is from one of our audience again. But uh, as a citizen, how do we prepare for a proxy war? See, now proxy war is a war fought by the adversary with some proxy. Now, at the moment, the proxy war is fought by Pakistan. And I dare say that we already defeated him in proxy war. I don't think he's now very capable of this thing, you know, doing in the... The biggest danger as a citizen you should be worried and I should be worried is that we call it something called as K2 collision. K2 is a Kashmir and Khalistan collision. We have suffered as a nation in 1984 when this issue came up. And believe me, it's not easy to fight. Our soldiers are from that build. Uh, and uh, things which can take a turn is, I mean, the consequences are terrible. You, I don't want to even watch my feelings. This is dangerous. As a nation, we have to pay proper attention. It doesn't get... Uh, out of proportion, and we take a proper precaution and nip it in the bud. 
Sure, sir. Uh, and our usual last question, but for a urban audience like Ville Parle, what is your message, sir, when it comes to the future and the defense of this country? Uh, I mean, uh, what one can say here is that, especially as I said in Mumbai and all people are all, you know, they are all geared up and they're charged up for, you know, helping the uh, defense forces or for the integrity of the nation or, you know, different things uh, where the nation can benefit. But what I can say is everybody says, Ki join the, you know, join the army and uh, join. I said, there is no question of joining the army. See, as we say, ki, oh, everybody should. We are enough. There is no dearth. I don't, I don't agree that no people are not coming. There are a number of people. There are 10 vacancies, you'll find 2,000 on the road. Or even the officers, they say good officers are not coming. There are. There is, see, NDA, there are 300 vacancies per six term. And every year, there are 7 lakh people appearing for the exam. So, is there a dearth? So, there is no dearth. Only thing is, what I feel, for the intellectually capable people like you, you have to support the nation in whatever way is possible. And mainly as a uh, security related issue, you have to support the armed forces. You know, as far as uh, other thing, internal security duties are concerned, you have to support the whatever government forces are there. That's what I can say. And not necessarily. People say, no, we have to contribute to the you know, armed forces so that no will see we get enough money. I am I am quite convinced about it. As far as armed forces, soldiers, everybody's concerned, there is no dearth of money. And so only what is required from a people to help give a moral support. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs>